So can BRICS actually become a global alliance that reflects the clout, the economic growth, the economic clout that these five countries actually have? Is it, as some Western analysts have put it, just a photo opportunity? For more on that, joining me tonight in the studio is Mr. Ashwini Kumar, Minister of State in the UPA government. Thank you very much for joining me tonight, sir. Also with me tonight is Mr. Ronan Sen, former ambassador to the United States and former ambassador to Russia. I'm also joined by Mr. Jeep Parthasarthi, former ambassador to Pakistan, and of course, Dr. C. Raja Mohan, strategic analyst at the Center for Policy Research. Mr. Ashwini Kumar, if I could begin with you, sir, the real focus on the impact of BRICS, because many would ask that in an alliance like this, China calls the shots at the moment because of its economic clout. The deep differences some would say distrust between India and China will inevitably lead to tension. China still doesn't endorse India's uh, request for a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. How much unity can we actually achieve? Well, let me tell you uh, the fundamental rationale and resident the author of the BRICS combination, for that matter, any other combination. In relation between nations, particularly in a situation where you are in the process of reordering the world or reshaping the world, whether you call it a new international economic order or a post-global economic crisis order. The fact is that there is realization amongst the BRICS countries, as indeed in the rest of the world, that the old institutions, which you call the Bretton Woods institutions, have outlived their utility and therefore you need to do something new. One of the most important factors that we now have to take into consideration is the reality of an interdependent, multipolar world where multilateral institutions will give the solutions. In that scenario, we all know that however powerful one nation may be, a, a, a combination of nations like BRICS, which represent 43% of the world's population, so about $16 trillion uh, of GDP, global GDP, $4 trillion in global reserves, will have a much stronger negotiating position in shaping the world and the institutions of the new global order in a manner that would enable them to advance the causes of their people. And the challenges are common. Therefore, the need for this unity. Within that, there may be differences in focus. There may be priorities. And India will have its priorities. China will have its priorities. China, India, South Af Africa, and Brazil are today countries that cannot be ignored. BRICS has become one of the most dominant forces. And I think it's a recognition of India's preeminent position in terms of it being the 10th trillion dollar economy of the world, in terms of its strategic power, in terms of yes. its soft power, that India is today placed on the high table of global politics. And today, I mean, it's a matter of great pride for India that today India is hosting the fourth BRICS meeting and our Prime Minister chairs this very important grouping. It's interesting you made that point about the Bretton Woods institutions because, of course, we know that BRICS hasn't been able to endorse a common candidate for, say, the World Bank presidency. And though, of course, uh, the U.S. nominated candidate is likely to win, uh, win as is the norm, though, of course, he is of Korean origin. Again, interestingly, the achievements, some would say, in coming together on Syria and Iran, politically, geopolitically, a very important move ahead. Do you think in the shaping, when you call it a reshaping the global power equations, that really would be key, a different view, a different worldview from the West. Yes, I think so, very much so. In fact, as I started by saying that in relation between nations, the, 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 the matter of international equities, the matter of distribution of power, diffusion of power, or the use of power, is a function of the equation of power. So one nation, however strong, for example, what somebody may ask, two permanent members of the Security Council, why do they have to have a separate grouping? They can veto anything as far as the shaping of the world order is concerned. Mm -hmm. But they do know that four or five countries together have a far more greater say uh, in convincing the others. And today, it is not also, in my view, at some stage it could be uh, a competitive relationship, but in, in many areas, the relationship is not competitive with the rest of the world. For example, today, post-global uh, economic crisis and the Eurozone crisis, yes. it is recognized that the economic growth is in these four countries. Until these countries grow, you can't balance the, uh, the economic growth in Europe or in America. So I think Europe, America, the BRICS nations, the G20, the emerging economies are today, in certain senses, in a, complementary, in a complementary relationship, and that is the burden of the New Delhi Declaration. They've talked of the common issues that they face in common, and they're seeking common responses. Uh, Dr. Raja Mohan, come in here. The, the government picture, uh, much more positive picture than you would see it, or would you also look at the positives that have come out of the Delhi Declaration and this meeting in New Delhi? I think some of this framing that this is, a, is it a new bloc countering the West? 
I mean, that I think is a completely red herring. I mean, if you actually read the declaration and our Prime Minister's speech or even Hu Jintao's speech, they're very careful not to make it a confrontation with the West. In fact, they repeatedly emphasize, look, we want the G20 is the main forum for economic and institutional reform. They talk about uh, helping Europe, that we need, everyone needs to grow together. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think they've claimed, the leaders have not claimed the kind of motives that have been imputed by either Western analysts or those of us here who want to, you know, see it as an anti-Western bloc. So I think it is a cautious effort. And these kind of uh, institutions, they take a long time to build. I mean, all that, what has actually been done today, mm -hmm. they basically said, look, we will begin to borrow in local currencies. I mean, that's all only one step. And the rest on the bank, they said, look, let's talk about it. The finance ministers will study, produce a report. So it, it's really going to be to very, very incremental, very, very slow. And finally, I think the interdependence today makes it that, look, you just can't go against the biggest uh, growth, uh, no, biggest economic groupings that is the West. Mm -hmm. So it has to be coordination, it has to be cooperation. And the issues we've taken up, for example, restructuring or changing the power balance within this organization, a lot of Americans are arguing that. Jeffrey Sachs has presented himself as a candidate against the official candidate. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a far more complicated picture than the West versus uh, rest. Okay. Do you have the NDTV Profit app? All the markets, all the news and your own homemade, ready-made portfolio available there for you. We will right now answer what you should sell, what you should buy when markets are down. Download at ndtvprofit.com slash apps. Get the best app for the channel you trust.